Chapter 27. Powhatan thus invited Captain Ratcliffe and 30 others to trade for corn, and having brought them within his ambush, murder, murdered them. William White, the Black Boy Ceremony. Point Comfort, February 1610. Snow falls, fine as sugar, but inside our cabin it is, it is toasty warm. I'm about to get scolded as usual. Samuel, what are you doing? Anne stands with her hands on her hips. I'm hiding, I say simply. Watch. She likes it when I pop my head out. I drop the handkerchief and Virginia erupts with giggles. Anne shakes her head, but she is smiling. I hide again. Virginia crawls to me, grabs the hand handkerchief, and pulls it away. She is so pleased with herself, she laughs and claps her hands. Samuel, stop your playing and come help me, Anna says. She needs more firewood. I do not hesitate, but jump up to do as she bids. I owe my life to her. After she heard what happened to Captain Ratcliffe and begged Captain Davies to retract my sentence, I don't know if I'd have survived the 20 lashings that were to be my punishment. <clears throat> Anne testified that I had done the right thing to convince her to be with her husband at Point Comfort. John, too, spoke up for me. He said I had meant well taking Virginia with me and that he could not afford to lose his best apprentice. I owe my life to both of them. I step outside. Leaving the warmth of our cabin, the air is crisp and sharp and smells of wood smoke. Snow swirls, coating the tree branches and giving everything a hushed feel. I'm wearing my moccasins, and so I walk lightly through the snow, quiet as Kainta taught me to be. I smile when I think of Kainta. When the river thaws, I will paddle across to visit him in the Werraskoyak village and trade for corn. In the meantime, the Kikoftans are very close by, and my blue beads have kept us well supplied with corn from them. I go to the lean-to that protects our firewood from rain and snow and stacks the heavy pieces of wood in my arms. I feel strong. I am strong. I look around at the cabins that house our Fort Algernon Eldred soldiers. I helped to build every one of them. Snow blows into my face and stings my cheeks, but I'm warm. An image flashes in my mind of another wintry day, what seems like a lifetime ago, of me and Richard blowing our embers in a cold cabin trying to coax up a fire. I feel a pang of missing him and missing Captain Smith too and Reverend Hunt. Then my mind goes back further still to a small fire and a fire friendly hearth and my mum bent over a pot stirring. I'm done all right mum. I send the words up to heaven to her. I'm living with a family with people I love and we have food and fire. The wind is blowing from the northwest from Jamestown. I wonder if I can smell the smoke of their wood fires more than 30 miles away, or if it is only our fort's fires I'm smelling. The river has been frozen for many weeks now, and we have not heard from them. Were they as warm and well-fed as we are? I wonder. A sudden chill makes me shiver. I feel it like a splash of cold water, and that old sense of doom and dread, the fear that made me desperate enough to snatch baby Virginia away. I shake it off quickly. No sense worrying about Jamestown now. I have my duties here, and we are safe here. Safe. The word settles on me like peace. And John and Virginia are here with me, and we are safe. I load my arms with a few more pieces of wood, then turn and walk back through the snow to our cabin. Afterward. Now all of us at Jamestown beginning to feel that sharp prick of hunger with no man truly described, but he who hath tasted the bitterness thereof. All was fish that came to net to satisfy cruel hunger, as to eat to eat boots, shoes, or any other leather some could come by. And now famine beginning to look ghastly and pale in every face, that nothing was spread, spared to maintain life and to do those things which seem incredible as to dig up dead corpse out of graves and to eat them. George Percy, a true relation of the proceedings and occurrence. During the winter of 1609-1610, the settlers at Point Comfort did not go hungry. They had enough extra fish and crabs that even their hogs were well fed. As winter set in, ice formed on the river and travel be between Jamestown and Point Comfort became impossible. It was not until spring that those at Point Comfort found out about the horror that befell Jamestown that winter. Chief Bohan ordered his tribes to stop trading with the settlers at Jamestown. 
The natives also went to Hog Island, which the settlers had stocked with hundreds of hogs and slaughtered them all. Then they went back to killing any settler they found outside the fort. Settlers were afraid to hunt and fish, so they remained inside the palisades. When the stores ran out and they'd eaten the last of their sheep and goats, they ate even the laying hens. As things got worse, they ate their horses, dogs, and cats, and then any rat, mouse, or snake they could catch. When that there was nothing left to kill, they even ate their starched collars, their leather shoes, anything that could be chewed and swallowed. Men, women, and children starved and died. Hunger caused desperation. Some of the colonists began to dig up the dead bodies and eat them. One group of men escaped that terrible winter by using violence to secure a large quantity of food from one of the native tribes and stealing one of the ships and sailing back to England. The remaining settlers were ravaged by disease, starvation, and a war warfare with the Indians. Out of the roughly 500 settlers, Captain Smith said, there were in Jamestown when he left. By spring, only 60 settlers remained, all of them close to death. The winter of 1609-1610 became known as the Starving Time. Tipahatan had tried again to wipe out the tribe that came from the Chesapeake, and he had nearly succeeded. In the spring of 1610, the man who was to be Jamestown's new governor in 1609, Sir Thomas Gates, finally arrived. He had been shipwrecked on Bermuda for nine months until new ships could be built from the remains of the sea venture. When Gates saw the desperate conditions in Jamestown, he decided to abandon the settlement and take the remaining survivors back to England. But as they sailed down the river, heading home, they were met by a messenger carrying a letter. It said that Sir Thomas West, Lord de la War, the new Lord Governor and Captain General of Jamestown, was on his way up the river to Jamestown with three ships over 150 new colonists, and food for a year. The message was clear, go back to Jamestown. Reluctantly, the settlers returned to try again. The next several years were difficult ones. Jamestown's new leaders took revenge on the natives, even the Kikoftans and the Weraraskoyaks, who had helped the settlers so much. They slaughtered native men, women, and even children from many tribes. Revenge bred revenge and there were raids and killing on both sides. In 1613, Pocahontas was capped, kidnapped by the settlers and held hostage. In return for her freedom, they demanded that their, her father free the English prisoners he was holding, give back stolen English weapons and tools, and send a large quantity of corn. Chipohontan gave the settlers some of what they asked for, saying he would send the rest when his daughter was returned to him. The English said this was not enough. Chipohontan refused to give in to the hostage taker's demands and Pocahontas remained a prisoner. John Rolfe, a new colonist, began growing tobacco in Jamestown. Tobacco grew well in Virginia and sold well in England, and finally there was hope that the colony would make a profit for the Virginia Company of London. While she was held prisoner, Pocahontas met John Rolfe. The two were married in 1614 with Chief Pocahontas' blessing. This began a period of time some historians called the Peace of Pocahontas. For a while, there was not as much bloodshed between the English and the natives, and the two groups shared the land together. Pocahontas, her husband John Rolfe, and their son Thomas were taken to England by Sir Thomas Dale to promote the Jamestown colony and help Dale get financial assistance. There she became ill and died in 1617. She was buried at St. George's. George's Parish Church in Gravesend, England. In 1619, the first Africans arrived in the Virginia colony on a privateering ship. It is not clear whether they were slaves or indentured servants, which means they would have to work for a number of days, a number of years, and then they would be free. But soon, especially with so much labor needed for the tobacco fields, Africans were brought to Virginia and sold as slaves for life. Was Reverend Hunt's prediction right? Did Samuel become something much greater than a servant? Yes. In 1619, the Virginia Company of London created the House of Burgess in Virginia. By that time, there, was, there were 11 settlements, and each settlement had its own leadership. Samuel Collier, by then a grown man, was recognized for his knowledge, skills, and ability to communicate with the natives in their own language. Captain Smith wrote that Samuel was appointed leader of a town. 
Captain John Smith was never able to return to Jamestown, but his writings are one of more of our most valuable records of what went on in the colony. The, the Powhatan prophecy ever reached its conclusion in 1622. Though Chief Powhatan had died, his empire was still strong, led by his brother, Opichenkanao. There were still many more natives than Europeans living in Virginia, but more settlers arrived on ships from England every couple of months, and they were taking over more and more of the land the Indians used for hunting and planting. Chief Opichenkanao now decided to wipe out the English once and for all. He carefully planned his attack. In March 22, 1622, 347 colonists were killed, about one-third of the Virginia European population. The settlers began raiding the Indian villages, killing and burning with the goal of exterminating the native people. War between the natives and the Europeans continued for years. Chief Opekina now did mount one more large attack on the settlers in 1644, but by then the European population had grown and the Indian population had been decimated. Chief Opanakanao was captured and killed and the Powhatan Empire crumbled. Just as the prophecy had predicted, the Powhatan Empire was destroyed by a new tribe that arrived from the Chesapeake Bay. During the first hundred years after the English arrived in 1607, over 90% of Virginia's native population was killed either in warfare, in massacres, or by the new diseases the Europeans brought with them. As Europeans took over more and more of their land, the natives were forced into, onto reservations, and then over time most of their reservation land was taken from them. There is, however, land in the Virginia countryside that, for thousands of years, have been home to the native peoples who still live there.